This is Dimitri Lascaris for the Real News Network reporting from Athens, Greece. Uh, this is part of our ongoing coverage of the economic crisis in Greece. We've come to Greece for the fourth time in three years to examine whether Greece has ultimately or finally begun to emerge from uh, this punishing economic crisis. And today we have the pleasure of being joined by Kostas Duzinas. Kostas is a professor of law and founder of the Birkbeck Institute for the Humanities at Birkbeck University of London. He was educated in Athens during the US-backed dictatorship of George Papadopoulos. And Professor Duzinas was elected the Greek Parliament in 2015 as a member of Syriza. And he's currently the chairperson of the Greek Parliament Standing Committee on National Defense and Foreign Affairs. And I've learned that he, his most recent book, one of several, is Syriza and Power, Reflections of an Accidental Politician. A very intriguing title, uh, Professor Duzinas. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for, join, for, for inviting me to join you. And I hope that we'll be able you know, to enlighten in parts the audience. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm very intrigued by the title of your yeah. book. Uh, it's, it's quite a striking title. What prompted you to write it and what was sort of the uh, central message you think that emerges from, from the book? Yeah. What prompted me to write it? Um, a pretty radical change in lifestyle and indeed a kind of cultural shock. Uh, as you kindly mentioned, I have been a professor in London. I've lived in London for 41 years of my life, the larger part of my life, uh, and of course f all my life I've been in the academy. And then 2015, in September, the second elections in 2015, after the referendum, when the government of uh, Premier Chippers uh, called elections, I was asked whether I wanted to stand to help uh, Syriza in its hour of need. And I accepted on the proviso that uh, I would participate in the elections, but I would be placed in a non-electable seat. So I would be elected and change my, my life and my uh, commitments of, uh, of a lifetime, really. And then, as it happened, because Syriza had a much better result uh, uh, than was expected, I was elected and I'm now a member of parliament for my home city of Piraeus. Now, the central, I suppose, the central idea or the central experience uh, of this book, which explores what it means after uh, a lifelong uh, experience in um, the academy and uh, in London, in England, uh, returning to Greece and uh, moving from the university to parliament and politics, uh, is this. I mean, speaking about the more political message, that we on the left were elected on a program of uh, rejection of austerity and deep reforms that would uh, uh, introduce into Greece for the first time since the fall of the junta uh, a social justice agenda. And of course that was not possible, not in any case in its full uh, force as a result of the third memorandum and the impositions that this government had to accept in that fateful uh, July negotiations uh, in Brussels. Uh, so what I'm trying to explain is what it means for a party, for a government, for people like me who have spent all their lives on the left, in my case the intellectual left, to have to serve in parliament and to pursue programs which are not necessarily in keeping with our ideas, with uh, our ideology, in my case with the books I was writing against austerity. Actually, sometimes contradiction is a kind of powerful force that allows you to move forward. And this is what I hope that I'm trying to show in the book, that despite certain compromises, despite uh, certain uh, agreements that went against the main positions of a party of the radical left, we are still there, we are still committed to ideas and policies of social justice, and I think we still remain, certainly in Europe and the European Union, the only government that speaks and tries to implement a different program for what the dominant forces of the European Union want us to do. In that election, the one that Syriza won for the first time, uh, it campaigned on something called the Thessaloni Thessaloniki program. And many regarded it on the left as a, as a modest, but nonetheless <laughs> modest, looked at, looked at in terms of left values, sure. but perhaps radical looked at in terms of the standards of the European Union, which have become intensely neoliberal. 
Uh, and some of the key elements of that platform were a substantial haircut on Greece's uh, unsustainable debt, higher salaries for some of the lower paid uh, employees, the abolition of a property tax called Enthia, uh, more money for municipalities and local authorities, 300,000 new jobs, restoration of public radio and television, which had been essentially brought to an end by the predecessor government, and uh, the restoration of the minimum wage at 751 euros. In your view, what uh, of these main planks, and if I've missed any, please feel free to mention them, uh, what have, has your party managed to implement in the face of uh, this, this austerity program? Uh, not a whole lot of them. I mean, a, a two or three of those you know, have been implemented. I mean, you mentioned the, uh, the closing down of public broadcasting. I mean, to use the, the British example, it is like closing one day the BBC down, you know, with many uh, TV channels, radio stations, and so on, and that, you know, was restored. In terms of the economic program, all those, um, all those items you mentioned, many of them were not implemented. Uh, that was the result, of course, of the, the agreement between the Premier Tsipras and the European powers in that uh, July set of negotiations. However, if we look at the totality of uh, things that happened ever, uh, since uh, September uh, 15, when I was elected, you would say that while uh, the policies and the measures that this government has introduced are not in any sense a grand left-wing program, it has achieved quite a lot. I mean, the first and most important thing was that it had to deal with an unprecedented humanitarian crisis. The fact that uh, uh, more than a quarter of national wealth of the GDP had been lost, that uh, uh, some 27% of people were unemployed, 60% uh, of young people were unemployed. Uh, the fact that the average income of uh, families had fallen by 40%. So you were in what we call the humanitarian crisis. And the government committed all its uh, limited resource uh, towards helping people in that situation. And we have had you know, a few pretty substantial achievements. For example, two and a half million people who were not insured for health uh, are now uh, fully insured and they can go to hospitals and get free uh, free uh, health care and did uh, free medication. That was a very major achievement. We did help with uh, the repossession of family homes, which have been stopped and therefore families hugely in debt who were unable to pay for their mortgages uh, did not lose their homes. Uh, we have moved very fast on the second plank of a left-wing program in contemporary uh, West, the contemporary Western world, which is the program of rights, the program of human rights. So we have introduced civil union for gay, lesbian uh, uh, people. We have recently we passed a law that will allow the reassignment of people whose uh, identity card uh, shows a gender that does not accord with their own self-identity. Uh, and we have throughout the period developed what has become known as a parallel program, a parallel program of economic justice. So while on the one hand we have to implement those extremely harsh measures uh, that were imposed upon Greece as a result of that third agreement, at the same time we unraveled and we are unraveling a, what is known as a parallel program, a program which uh, attempts to ameliorate the uh, the effects, the very bad effects of those measures, particularly for the poorer uh, members of society. But I should finish by making a, a further point, a political point. The September uh, 2015 elections, in which uh, Syriza got elected again, had something quite unique. It had never happened before, either in Greece or in the other uh, countries that went through this program. Uh, so-called uh, uh, transformation and reform program. Uh, Tsipras came back to Athens, called for that referendum, and uh, after the deal that he was trying to get uh, in early June uh, fell through, and when he won the referendum and had this long night, 17 hours of negotiations, instead of just staying on, power, on in power, as other governments would have done, honestly explained to people what had happened, honestly accepted 
that the Thessaloniki program, but more widely, the ideology of a radical left party and government had been defeated and then asked people to choose their future government between the defeated but still pretty honest uh, government committed to the dignity of the Greek people and the other opposition parties which were clearly totally in favor of that program, particularly the right-wing opposition, because it forms their basic ideology. And the Greek people voted for it. So to that extent, this government has a certain legitimacy. Of course, we don't like many of the measures we had to implement. I mean, in my case, I'm a member of parliament from Piraeus. Obviously, we did not like the fact that the port of Piraeus had to be privatized and sold off to a Chinese uh, government, uh, company, something uh, uh, against which the series of the Piraeus series of people had always, uh, had always uh, opposed. So you have to live in a new situation in which you are fully aware that you are faced with a pretty, a pretty negative balance of forces and a quite vindictive and indeed failing economic orthodoxy and you have to zigzag your way through there. In other words, on the one hand, uh, accept that, those measures and try to implement them, but at the same time introduce measures which will help people to stand up again. And I think now we are reaching a point at which perha a, 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 perhaps a tilting point at which for the first time the government may be able to pursue so it's a social justice program with fewer impositions from the Europeans. So let's talk about zigzagging on the international stage. And you've yeah. been focusing on zigzagging in terms of domestic policy and social and economic policy. Uh, Prime Minister Tsipras uh, just completed a visit to uh, Washington with President Trump. Uh, as I've pointed out in several of the interviews we've done this far, and I've done that because I think this is something that's really not well known uh, to uh, many of our viewers in North America that uh, the U.S. government of uh, the administration of Richard Nixon enthusiastically supported the dictator Papadopoulos, who was or had been during the Second World War a Nazi collaborator. And, um, you know, I, I think it's fair to say that President Trump has not until now shown a particular regard for democratic institutions and principles. Uh, but nonetheless, Prime Minister Tsipras yesterday or the day before talked about shared democratic values, specifically mentioning President Trump not focusing so much on the American people's values, but on those of President Trump. And in response, uh, or around the time that uh, he was having these meetings and this discussion was going on, you were quoted in The Guardian uh, talking about the use of soft power. And, uh, and you commended the use of soft power. And I'm curious to know what, what you meant by soft power. And I'm even more curious to know what you feel are the concrete benefits, or have been up until now, the concrete benefits of Syriza's employment of soft power for the ordinary Greek citizen. Yeah, I mean, soft power is a term used in international politics, international relations, and it was in this context, particularly because of my position as a chairperson of the Defense Foreign Relations Committee, that I was uh, mobilizing this term. Uh, let me start from a more general point. Uh, you remember during the Cold War, we always talked about the two superpowers, you know, deterrence, uh, mutual assured destruction, you know, this idea that the whole world is stabilized around the relationship between the West and, you know, the East, uh, what Reagan used to call the evil empire, which of course, once it fell, it opened the gates of hell because in the first period after 1989, after George Bush announced the New World Order, uh, people talked about the single he hegemon. You know, the United States had become the only power in uh, world politics, both economically, militarily, politically, and the rest of it. But then, after the uh, financial crisis, which then became economic and political, particularly in places like Greece and the wider Mediterranean, we have seen a new development in international politics, the creation of a multipolar world. I mean, you mentioned Nixon supporting the Greek dictatorship, but then Nixon also went to China. And it was the beginning of that thaw in the 
Sino-American relations, which has led now to China becoming uh, the second world economy and moving fast to overtake the United States. And then you have all the powers, Russia, you have uh, the BRICS, the so-called BRICS, uh, you know, Brazil and so on. So we are moving in a new world order in which Trump and Trump's promises in its campaign, uh, in a sense, marked a clear change from the position of the United States in the past uh, and its current position. A clear change towards a certain degree of protectionism of the American economy. Of course, the, uh, the, uh, you know, the United States always protected its steel and its corn and so on. But now it was very clear. The Trump message was we have to protect our citizens, our workers, to create jobs and so on. And secondly, uh, that kind of isolationism, Jacksonian politics as we call them, you know, sort of the retreat from the position of the global sheriff that, you know, we knew uh, the uh, United States to be up until uh, recently. Now that uh, seems to me to be a recognition of that change in configuration in the balance of forces. Now what does Greece, a small country and a small party, a party committed to the left, uh, do in, in that situation. We are, Greece is, in a situation, let's put it, of poverty. Of poverty, not just economic, but also in terms of its power, in terms of its influence and so on. You see that there is a, a, a new configuration uh, developing in international affairs with powers, new powers emerging, all powers re um, reacquiring, you know, a certain importance and influence internationally. So what uh, a, a, a Greek government, whether of the left or the right, should do is precisely to develop uh, links with all the emerging players so that, you know, it can help itself uh, by being a kind of honest broker. And I think only the left actually could do it. I said the left or right, but only the left could do it. I mean, Mr. Tsipras went to the United States and met Trump and had some good words about the President Trump uh, that certainly I do not share and very many other people uh, do not share. But on the other hand, Mr. Tsipras, uh, in the year preceding the uh, White uh, House visit, had been to China twice, had been to Iran, we had here President Obama come to give his uh, valedictory speech. We had President Hollande of Hans coming over, Putin of Russia. Suddenly, out of this utter poverty that Greece had found itself uh, and a certain isolation because it was the only radical left government, you know, preaching a different lesson uh, from what the Europeans and, of course, the American neoliberals uh, are talking about. Greece emerges as a small player which does not have economic power, remains poor, but has a certain moral standing as the only government that stood up and despite the concessions and even defeats that uh, she suffered, is prepared to speak a different language internationally and uh, domestically. For me, soft power meant that Greece is emerging as a player that can speak honestly even to people who are totally opposed to its uh, positions. So Professor Duzinas, you talked about the concept of the honest broker. You identified a number of states uh, in this new multipolar world uh, such as Iran, Russia, China and so forth. And I think it's fair to say that all of them to varying degrees have the ability to look out for their own interests. But there's a case which, in which the whole concept of the honest broker, I think, needs to be challenged insofar as Greece's foreign policy and concern, and that's the case of the Palestinian people. Uh, the Palestinian people are in a position of uh, extreme uh, vulnerability and weakness vis-a-vis -vis their principal adversary, the State of Israel, and, uh, and we know uh, it's been widely reported that the United Nations Security Council uh, at the end of last year un unanimously adopted a resolution uh, condemning the settlements in the West Bank as a flagrant violation, that was the UN Security Council's term, of the Fourth Geneva Convention. The UN Security Council called on member states to distinguish between uh, the territory of Israel and the occupied territories in its dealings with Israel. Uh, the, the International Court of Justice has unanimously ruled that the settlements violate the Fourth Geneva Convention. And yet, the press reported in 2015 that the government of uh, Prime Minister Tsipras was going to disregard an EU directive uh, 
which simply required, it didn't boycott or ban settlement products, which would have been an entirely reasonable thing to do given their legal status under international law. It simply required that those products not be identified as product of Israel. What is going on here? I mean, can you, do you think you can fairly be described Greece's position vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinian people in Israel as that of an honest broker? Do you think that this accords with the fundamental values of uh, Syriza and of a left-wing party uh, to deal in this manner with the government of Benjamin Netanyahu, who Richard Falk, uh, international legal scholar, says is committing the crime of apartheid? How do we explain the attitude of the Greek government towards uh, the plight of the Palestinian people? Uh, let me start by saying that I had the great honor to draft the resolution for the Hellenic Parliament asking the government to recognize the uh, state of Palestine. And I have the further great honor to be the person who introduced President Abbas in the Greek Parliament in December of uh, 2015. It was one of the great moments of my life. And uh, to come now to the beef of your question, uh, it is true that uh, over the last uh, three or four years, there has been a, a coming together or coming more together than was the case in the past between Greek foreign policy and Israel. This, however, has not affected, to my knowledge, the extremely warm, extremely uh, friendly, indeed, uh, almost fraternal links between the Greek people and uh, the Greek left uh, with the Palestinian, uh, with the Palestinian uh, people uh, and the help for their suffering. So every time that I go to Israel, invited by the Israeli authorities as a chair of this committee, I always go to Ramallah. Uh, indeed, in my more recent visit, I did uh, get involved in that sense of the honest broker in the business of the hunger strike of the Palestinian prisoners, you remember, uh, a few months ago. Uh, and I expressed in the strongest possible terms in the Knesset uh, the uh, problems that exist with the Israeli policies uh, in relation to uh, the uh, occupied territories, prisoners, uh, and other, a number of other issues uh, involving human rights. Uh, the, 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 the quite a question is this, and in a sense takes us back to uh, the earlier, my earlier point. Uh, when you are involved in a situation in which the, 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 you, know, you have to deal with conflicts that go back to long histories and uh, which have become intractable. Uh, to be an honest broker, to try and help uh, move the situation forward, you have to talk to both parties. And uh, Greece traditionally was closer to uh, the Arab world and closer to the PLO that uh, opened uh, offices in Athens you know, in the early 80s, at the point at which there were no close relations with the State of Israel. Uh, the position has changed over the years, and at this point in time, where all kinds of questions about energy security, about uh, international uh, links, international relations, international coalitions and so on is so much at the center of uh, our attention. Having good relations with a state like Israel, while at the same time every opportunity given, I think, to me or to a series of party and so on, we insist on criticizing uh, Israeli policies and we do everything we can to help the Palestinian people. I'm not speaking here as a representative of the government. You know, I'm a parliamentarian. I am an academic. I, you know, I've written these things and I will repeat them again and again and again. And there are differences of opinion, there are nuances uh, between uh, members of uh, government, between the government and the party, between the uh, opposition, uh, the left-wing opposition, and Syriza itself. These are all well understood. And uh, I'd like to ask you, as a, a, sure. as a citizen, yeah. not as a representative of, uh, of Syriza, and as a, as, a, as a man with keen understanding of human rights law and the plight of the Palestinian people, do you think it's right for the Greek government to defy an EU directive requiring the accurate labeling of settlement products? I'm not aware of this uh, instance. I take it that uh, your information is, is correct. Um, actually, this is the first time 
I've heard about it because in all the international meetings I have been uh, present with Israeli representatives, they always bring it up as a question of criticism of the European Union and they have not mentioned to me uh, that Greece has exempted itself from that position. Uh, you may be right. Let us assume that you are right. You know, I, I don't know, but you know, sort of I take your word for it. If that is the case, yes, I would disagree. I would disagree. Uh, you know, Greece has created, as part of this multifaceted foreign policy, uh, a number of uh, tripartite uh, links with states. One uh, relevant to what we're discussing is that between uh, Greece, Cyprus and Israel. But at the same time, we created another tripartite relationship between Greece, Cyprus and the Palestinian Authority. Um, international relations are weird. Of course, you are right in saying, and for me, as someone who has written many books on human rights, occasionally I'm not fully satisfied if, for example, in the very good relations that this government has with the government of Egypt, does not always, or does not strongly criticize some of the policies of President Sisi. Right. Similarly, who's, who's accused of crimes against humanity by human rights. All kinds parties. of things, and from the evidence we have, you know, so they're extremely serious. The same with Israeli policy. Uh, however, you know, as an experienced journalist, that in international relations, human rights are used in a very hypocritical way. Uh, you have now lots of uh, criticism against China or against Russia, while at the same time China holds the largest part of the American debt or Russia is the main provider of natural gas to Western Europe. And I am always reminded of the fact that I think perhaps Madeleine Albright had said when she was uh, State Secretary, uh, that uh, you know, before going to China, we always say, ah, what about this or that dissident? And perhaps the Chinese make a cosmetic move or two, and then we feel that our conscience, you know, sort of is fully satisfied, and then we go and discuss trade. So human rights in the international field, you know, is something that is used basically to help friends and condemn enemies. It is not something that's been used universally and consistently across the field. So. Uh, just to, to conclude, I will not. I, I will not contest that proposition. One I owed. I think that's precisely correct. But uh, but I also I've written a whole book on yes. human rights and empire, in which I explore precisely that hypocritical yes. and opportunistic use of but human one, rights and moralizing in the yes. international relations field. But one hopes that a party committed to the principles of uh, progressivism and human rights will depart from that nefarious conception of human rights and international law and international relations. Uh, let me move on to another, thank you for your candor in, in answering my question. Uh, let me move on to the question of NATO. Uh, and I'd like to conclude our discussion here. I'm very, this came up, uh, I understand, in a meeting between Prime Minister uh, Tsipras and President Trump, the level of military spending and President Trump uh, commended Greece for spending in excess of 2% of its GDP on its military. Um, and perhaps there was even a trade-off there in exchange for that. He was prepared to say something like, I'm going to uh, endorse responsible debt relief for Greece. Uh, but nonetheless, 2.3%, uh, 2.38% of GDP being spent by a country that by any rational measure is bankrupt. The debt is completely unsustainable, 329 billion euros. I think it's 188% of GDP now. Um, how does the government explain that it is the second highest spender in NATO, a very wealthy collection of states, when effectively the state of Greece is bankrupt. Yeah, that takes us back you know, to the whole history of uh, the political and military establishment in Greece, which of course has uh, put at the center of uh, both domestic and international policy the different threats that Greece has faced over its history, its recent history. So in the 50s and the 60s, it was the threat from the north, the communist countries, Bulgaria or Romania or Yugoslavia. Now it is Turkey. There is a very major issue with Turkey. Turkey is a huge country, has one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, standing army after China, while Greece is a small nation of 10, 11 million people, and we have continuous challenges and continuous threats coming from Turkey on Cyprus, of course, and you know the Cyprus issue, that this is the only country that is still divided by occupying troops, and 
all kinds of challenges and provocations in the Aegean, in northern eastern Greece and so on. Now, do I agree with the proposition that the defense budget of Greece should be well above 2%? And this was the case well before Trump started using the 2% as a kind of shibboleth, as a kind of, you know, sort of the big number. Now, you know, as an academic, you know, seeing the state of our universities, uh, the lack of uh, teachers, the non-replacement of retiring professors, the lack of, uh, of school teachers and uh, primary care teachers, of course, it is not something that I would accept uh, if, I were, if I were to have a, a clean slate to start from scratch as to how you're going to distribute your very limited budget. It, no, it, I wouldn't do that. On the other hand, you have inherited a situation that was exactly like that well before Syriza got into power. And of course, as you know, Syriza is in a coalition with a small party which tends to be very, very uh, voluble on the question of defense and security and links with Turkey. Had Syriza been in absolute majority and not in need to enter a coalition with the independent Greeks party, the leader of uh, which is also the Secretary for Defense, perhaps the situation would be diff different. So, but to finish, I mean, are we in an ideal world? Of course we're not in an ideal world. Uh, do I like what is happening in this and a number of other issues that you, we have not discussed so far? No, nobody is. I don't think the government is. On the other hand, we're trying hard. The interest that I think the international left has on Greece, which has remained, in my experience, totally undimmed uh, after the compromise, uh, defeat, whatever, uh, word you want to use remains huge. You know, this is the first radical government in Europe elected uh, democratically on three separate occasions and with a huge referendum result, which finds itself in a minefield. The reason that Syriza could not succeed, and still many powers do not want to succeed, is that any such success would have given a sign to all other, all kinds of left or patriotic or democratic forces in Europe and elsewhere, that if you stand up, you can eventually win. The debt of Greece is huge. In relative terms, it's really very little for the great European for, uh, powers like Germany or France uh, and so on. However, Greece and Syriza had to be defeated politically, and I feel that we have resisted that. We're still there, we're still fighting, and certainly in the next period, well, as I said, we have a bit of uh, room for maneuver, uh, perhaps we'll start doing even better according to your criteria. <laughs> well, I can't thank you enough for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure speaking to you. Yeah. And uh, I hope we'll have the opportunity to visit with you again uh, as, the, uh, as the, the, the reign of Syriza progresses. Thank you very much, Dimitri. And I think programs like yours are of huge importance because there's quite a lot of misinformation about Greece uh, internationally. And we need more of that to get the other side's position you know, put forward to the American and the global public. Well, thank you again. And, and this has been Dimitri Lascaris reporting for The Real News from Athens, Greece.